Hey there, Dice Jockeys, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And we may be virgins to today's main subject, but it would behoove you to remember these are singularly the horniest creatures made in the Monster Manual. We're talking about unicorns on WebDM. This week's episode is sponsored by Hero Forge, the masters of customizable miniatures. Design all your characters at home. Who's got a 3D printer? You can design your minis on their site and then digitally download your designs as STL files for only a few bucks. If you don't have a 3D printer, you can still get them sent to your door in a variety of materials, from plastic to bronze. They've got new features and updates all the time. Check it out, link in the comments and description. Okay, Jim. Let us seek out and find the essence of the unicorn. That most rarest of beasts. The purest, the divine protector. Or wait, hang on, first uh, off. Yeah, okay, what are we doing? Are unicorns celestial or are they <laughs> fey? Because in the monster manual it says they're celestials. Uh -huh, uh -huh. In the DMG, under the fey wild, it says that it's, uh, they hang they're, out, they're there. They hang out there, yeah, yeah. So do the gods put them in the Feywild or are they Fey creatures also? How would, how, what's your ruling on that? What do you think? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, the fact that they're Celestials in Fifth is is weird to me. I would put them with the other sorts of sylvan, uh, you know, type creatures, the dryads and treants and, right. uh, and like owlbears even, I would consider uh, mm -hmm. to be sort of a part of that. And even when you look in the description of the monster, it's like, well, they're Celestials of Fey gods. And it's like, first off, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, let's back up for a minute. The Fey have gods? <laughs> yeah. Like, I thought they, I mean, they have like powers and archfey and things like that, but it's like, there's got, like, I don't know, maybe they're talking about Corell and uh, Larthane. I like them as fairy creatures. And, yeah. and because they, to me, like the appeal of the unicorn is that untamed majesty, the, the, the wild spirit mm -hmm. uh, and the like. To me, they speak of like Mustangs and sort of wild horses. The book goes out of its way to say, oh, well, they're not really horses. Like to me, they're, they're st they carry all of the power and majesty of the horse, which is a majestic animal that you should pay more attention to and be kind and gentle. Because these animals will die for you. Yeah, I love horses. Anyway, horses are awesome. They are very awesome, and they're 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 a kind of creature that mankind's domesticated and and spent a lot of time with, and what responds to us. And so the idea that there's an animal that that does, isn't like that, right? That's sort of removed from that and represents something wild and something. Uh, pure at, yeah. at heart, unspoiled. Uns unspoiled. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it has parallels with like the stag or the heart, whereas the stag has the antlers and, and, and the like, the unicorn has its uh, alicorn. They still sort of symbolize that same untamed spirit of, of nature, the nobility of, of certain animals and the symbolism that we project onto them. Make the unicorn something that I, it's like, do something more with it than just like, Oh, it's like an angel, but a horse with a horn. It doesn't like, have that's wings, what... but those other ones do. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. But... Wings and a horn? Come on. <laughs> Come on. They can fly and sting. Yeah, it's a pegacorn. <laughs> uh, it's a... Um... It's a fun sort of uh, monster, but it also it's cutesy legacy, right? Yeah. The sort of My Little Pony legacy, the the the, the Lisa Frank legacy. That you don't say. Like, yeah, you don't say. It's like <laughs> some people might not look at it and go, "This is, has a place in my D and D game." They might go, "What? what for real? Unicorns? Like mm -hmm. seriously?" You know, it's worth chatting about. Although I I will admit this one's been a struggle for me to sort of think about and dwell on and kind of come up with some fresh takes because it is at the end of the day like it's a horse with a horn on it and it heals people <laughs> and itself jim and to me it's a fake creature okay yeah i mean yeah it's pure and it's it, it can be like so pure that it reaches divinity sure yeah, yeah. in a way but i've always seen them as more fake creatures not celestials yeah um, yeah and, and like, but i'd hate to take away you know even one more thing that you could summon with <laughs> that you can't celestial. that you can't summon without a ninth level uh, conjure celestial sure it's sort of like the blending of categories mm -hmm. and the idea you know D, &D separates out and and compartmentalizes these creatures into various categories categories and in many ways sort of sterilizing them and and taking away some of their mystique in order to make them intelligible and and sort of accessible and the unicorn is kind of one of those where 
I sort of feel that way. It's like, is it, it, it seems to fall under Fae more, but then when I think about it for a minute, it's like, if they're like guarding the natural places of the world, then the creators of those natural places, those sacred locations, maybe those are gods. Do we need to make this clear of a distinction between like celestial spirit and, and seely Fae? Like maybe there's, they're more alike than we think. Those are a lot of reasons why I personally don't care for like creature types <laughs> in terms of, uh, of a category. Let's quickly like uh, kind of move through, I mean, what the unicorn can do. Uh, so obviously it has a great, char it has a charge attack. Certainly. I mean, if you've got a horn on your head, you better be able to charge with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about these horns for a minute as well, because they're like huge. Yeah, they're you giant. Know, they're gigantic. They're not, I have one right here. This is my, I took this one from a foal, unicorn foal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, they, they're like this, right? They're gigantic, two feet long, 35 inches. Like they're just these giant spear tips. Mm -hmm. Not these sort of like little things. So yeah, it's got a charge attack. It's got the horn. It's going to fight evil with it. Well, yeah, I mean, it has to keep evil at bay out of its grove. <laughs> um, but they also come with some, some uh, spell casting, some yeah. at will, where detecting good and evil and pass without trace, which makes sense. Makes sense, yeah. Um, and druid craft. Uh, it also can do some calm emotions and uh -huh. dispel evil, which can get rid of like curses and stuff, right? Yes. It's kind of a combo dispel magic and banishment yeah, a little spell. Bit. Yeah, a little bit. Depending on how you use it. It gets some healing a few times a day and it can teleport, which makes right. sense. It adds to that mystique where it's it's over here and all of a sudden it's just gone. I, I do like that. Um, and of course, its attacks are magical with, with hoof and horn. Nice. That's, that'd be a good tavern name. The hoof and horn, horn. yeah, the hoof. Of course, it gets legendary action, CR5, yeah. where it can heal itself, and it also does this, sh it can have a shield, because it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, protection. Protection from others. First off, it's an animal you kind of want on your side. Yeah, you know, they can really, um, you know, help you out and, and sort of like lend you aid. I find that it's a hard creature to fit in, mm -hmm. simply because it's a horse. And uh, Craig Morong, do they have telepathy, anything like that? Like, how do they communicate with, like, they can understand a lot of languages, you know? Uh, I believe, uh, if, I, if I read that correctly, I think they can speak the elven sylvan languages. Okay, all right. So I would um, have them, some kind of communicative ability, either telepathy, a horse that talks. Uh, yeah, they can speak celestial, elvish, sylvan, and they, sorry, they do have telepathy out of okay, 60 they feet. Okay, yeah. they do have it. That makes a lot of sense. That, it's a lot better than uh, the... Right, and <laughs> it opens up more <laughs> options for them, and I would use them in the in the role of like king of the beasts. Mm -hmm. Like the the unicorn is the angel of the animal kingdom. Yeah, it's less concerned with people and less concerned with uh, you know what goes on there, except in so far as it encroaches upon their domain. And it's the fact that this unicorn, you know, throughout its enchanted forest or whatever, it's, it has an effect on normal animals. It has the pass without trace, which of course has a radius that other animals could benefit from. You can imagine like the court of a unicorn is sort of like this secluded glade in which bears and wolves and, and all sorts of field animals and birds of prey and reptiles and everything sort of are there present because they're there to get their <laughs> wounds tended to mm -hmm. or healed or, you know, that one of them's paw hurt in a trap or something, or, you know, they're there to, to, to seek uh, comfort or something because one of their den mates was caught in a snare representing like sort of uh, a more fairy tale aspect of D and D that is always present there. But we sometimes forget in terms of like the swords and sorcery and the action Mm -hmm. That there are quiet moments of fantasy where normal everyday things take on a fantastic quality, you know, because of just some minor change. Mm -hmm. Like having a creature that's like, no, I look out for this forest. These, this, yeah. these are my people. Yeah, one of the more interesting things are like the the fact that when they do have a domain, like those those effects on the area of the domain. Yeah. That I that I really like. Top of the four effects that actually you know are are important to players, quote unquote. I love the the part where it talks about how animals act as if they're tame yeah if they live in its domain so right, you right. have just foxes and wolves that are just kind of like hanging out and they're yeah. like what's up dude you know how's it going yeah you know yeah, like yeah. they're not they're not trying to kill everything they're mm -hmm. just you know the the whole lion lays with the <laughs> lamb kind of aspect yeah. of it yeah right? yeah well and that also ties in strongly with their real life symbolism in which the unicorn and jesus christ are often synonymous they're, mm -hmm. they're sort of like especially like alchemical texts and esoteric texts there's a lot of symbolism there mm -hmm. his side wasn't pierced by a spear it was a unicorn. <laughs> right. What I hear in the description there and what you're talking about, it reminds me a lot of The Last Unicorn, which yeah. is a book and then a movie uh, later on, uh, animated movie, really 
really cool. These hunters are frustrated by their lack of ability to to catch, you know, game and and they think like, oh, well, I guess it's like it must be the unicorn. And they sort of taunt it by, oh, you're the last one, you know, you're not going to be mm-hmm. around for much longer. And then it is about sort of discovering these magical creatures, what's happened to them. And so like in that sense it's it's centered around um a unicorn but it's their sort of protective nature it's the fact that they do represent this kind of purity and goodness and protection that gives them such meaning in that uh in the last unicorn and i feel like you can really do a lot with that Mm -hmm. if you play into the links between the symbolic thing and the thing it represents and like if the unicorn is pure if the unicorn is uh you know untamed then what happens when <laughs> that pure, untamed creature is harmed? What part of the real world is going to be affected by that? Yeah. Is the land going to be despoiled now? Is the do, Are we going to have to heal the unicorn to heal ourselves? I love that idea where, where literally the, the unicorn itself and the land it, it protects is connected. Yeah. So if you were to harm part of it, then you go over there and there's a there's a rend in the land. All the trees have been blighted. Yeah. You know, yeah. things like that where you... You can see the effect, yeah. the microcosm. You know, this is taken from uh, uh, Blue Rose, which is a sort of a romantic fantasy setting in which its rulers are sort of selected by a magical deer, a heart, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in this case. The, you can kind of do the same with a, a, a unicorn, right? Like, what if as part of uh, bestowing legitimacy on a ruler or elected uh, official or whatever in your D&D games, like, they have to seek the blessing of the unicorn of the realm, which means they've got to travel to the forest, that, which is protected by both law and magic. And they've got to mm-hmm. find this creature that does not want to be found, but represents a kind of, uh, you know, a legitimacy. Yeah. That if the unicorn accepts the ruler, then the people will... Well, only the pure of heart will be able to find it, right? Yeah, how else are you going to be sure that your ruler isn't... <laughs> closet demon worshiper or something mm-hmm. uh and so like those kinds of things where you're starting to like the unicorns already used in the symbology of real world monarchs and things like that so we're taking inspiration from say austria and denmark and like and now bringing it into our games and having something that mm-hmm. makes your world more magical in yeah. that sense right oh definitely and i love the the domain effects uh, to go yeah. back to those to to kind of reinforce that yeah because when the party gets in that area and they're trying to light the campfire yeah and all of a sudden like it's not working. nothing fire doesn't work <laughs> yeah. because we cannot burn this place down yes you know, only a hooded lantern yeah uh, that is has a separation and is it because it's an iron hooded lantern? I mean, Ooh, if it's yeah. Fey, then yeah, that's why. Yeah, I mean, right? It could be right. Yeah, uh, certainly. The natural creatures of the of the area that have advantage to hide, so it's harder to find game, like you uh-huh, were saying. Uh-huh. And then maybe they start to notice, you know, with the uh, the healing. I like I like this, where if it's a goodly person healing a goodly person, mm-hmm. it's always at max. Yeah, you get max healing back. A priest might accidentally stumble upon an area that thinks that they're it's blessed because oh, I heal people here and I can fully heal them. Yeah, you know, certainly could. You certainly could, and it, it could be that like the attraction of creatures like unicorns, like especially if you're going there more of a, uh, you know, a magical beast, a, you know, a creature that you can find. They're not you know placed by the gods or or crossed over from fairy. They're just a reclusive magical beast, like most like people thought in our own uh, world for a long time. Yeah, that you would maybe try to find out what attracts them to a forest, what causes them to claim a particular one, and like try to draw them there and maybe make it inviting maybe make it like listen we don't really go in there <laughs> you know we don't mess around with it but mm-hmm. we also need somebody there because we don't want it filled with ogres we don't want a bunch of goblins to take up mm-hmm. residence there and so the wild places of the world inside these dnd kingdoms might you might be trying to attract good creatures like this to live there because like, yeah, we're, we're not gonna bother you, but we just really don't want this place to become a haven for, you know, the creatures of shadow. And so it could be that you go on like a reverse monster hunting style it's more expedition. Just... So it's like... <laughs> where, you're, where you're going out and finding applicants. Where yeah, yeah. You're that's going... a whole kind of different monster.com. Uh, yes, exactly. For... <laughs> yeah, and you're trying to beseech these powerful creatures like, hey, come and live with us. Be part of our realm. You know, a different way to approach the uh, monster mm-hmm. hunting genre. <laughs> the last domain is the fact that it uh, curses affecting good people mm. are suppressed while they're there. Yeah. So if you have a PC or maybe someone else, like an yeah. NPC, that finds this place and all of a sudden that Gesh isn't 
right. isn't or isn't affecting them. Yeah, that lycanthropy is gone. The full mm -hmm. moon came and went, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. You could even imagine that there are like uh, you know something like convents or monasteries or something in these forests that are protected by the unicorns because like. Yeah, like we, you know, we can't all get rid of it. I know this D and D remove curse third level, and unicorns can do it. But let's pretend for a minute, like there, there's something that can't just easily get rid of it, but it can be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And so, like there might be colonies of lycanthropes or or others who've been cursed by these that make them monsters, turn them into monsters. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. we we want to seek out the safety of the unicorn's protection because it's what keeps us from harming our neighbors. Yeah. So it keeps us from harming ourselves, our loved ones. Yeah. And, and like while we're either, either while we're waiting to be freed from this curse or whether it can be lifted at all, like the proximity to this creature is, is, uh, is going to help us. And this is one of the reasons why when you're making a setting and like, Laying it out and, and get, you got you got your maps and all that other stuff is to find out what creatures live there where they live so that you can start seeing the Magical landscape of the creatures that inhabit your world, mm -hmm. you know in addition to the physical uh, geography Just because you go to the unicorn to, for it to heal you doesn't mean it has to sure it's like one be, of those a day it could, Yeah, it could, <laughs> it could be a thing where it's like well, yeah, but you you can stay here for a year and a day. Yeah, and if I observe you yourself, that you're though. good of heart, even yeah. though they can detect it, yeah. but you have to prove it and yeah. prove patience, then I will lift your curse. It's kind of like you're proving it to yourself. The unicorn knows. Yeah. You're, you've got to prove it to yourself that you can make the change necessary. And then once the unicorn is satisfied that you know, mm -hmm. then it'll, it can bestow its grace upon you. And what they didn't know is the unicorn went ahead and did it. Man, just just change comes from within, man. Not the friends we met along the way, even. Not all people are searching for good. At certainly, unicorns, yeah, though, yeah. Because certainly they not. do have a lot of qualities about them that, that they are do. sought after. That they do. That they do. They uh, the, so the alicorn, the unicorn's horn, has a variety of magical properties, and mm -hmm. uh, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, it's. Uh, you know, it's sort of imbued with the divinity that the, the unicorn has, and therefore they make magic weapons, uh, you know, wands and the like that will channel divine energy and things like that. It makes no mention of, like, restrictions on alignment use or whatever for using a unicorn horn, simply harming a unicorn. Is what it is. So presumably a dying unicorn might gift its horn to yeah. someone as a, hey, this is my final act. Uh, or whatever, or the party finds a dead or dying unicorn or able to uh, acquire its horn, or you know, maybe you find a way to pull a bait and switch and they're sent to get a unicorn horn and they think it's gonna be okay or there won't be any repercussions and then no, actually there might be and now they've got to negotiate, uh, you know, that uh, that conundrum. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, whether it's curing poison or creating these sort of like panacea type potions, other alternate med medicinal uses mm -hmm. uh, for unicorns. But when you go searching for kinds of things that people attributed uh, two unicorns in the real world, which sort of starts with the Greeks and but there's also sort of Persian and uh, and sort of the uh, Indus River Valley civilization has other influences as well and all the way down like uh, Africa. So it's like this kind of creature that's a deer horse thing, maybe with a horn, maybe with two something. So it appears all over the place and in almost all of them it's sort of like it purifies water. It purif It can get rid of poisons and diseases. Cups made out of the uh, the horn will resist poisons. Mm -hmm. And if you wear like a leather belt made <laughs> made from unicorn leather, it'll protect you from certain diseases. And like boots made from unicorn leather will protect you from other kinds of diseases. And so, sort of an all-purpose <laughs> ingredient. And that makes it treasure. It makes it a reward. Yeah. Uh, and certainly for like, say, if you've got a paladin in the party or something, being gifted a unicorn's horn in a, in a clearly, unambiguously, you know, you don't have to feel bad about this kind of way. It gifts it to you to continue to fight against evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or it can, what if they shed their horns? You oh, know, like killing what if, a snake? Yeah, yeah. You know, what if it's just sort of like they, they sort of shed their horn and regrow it or or like it's a it's a yearly kind of thing mm -hmm. or some sort of tied to a cycle so that it not necessarily results in their demise, but if it's freely given, it contains this potency. Yeah. I can see lots of different ways of getting them that <laughs> the magic that's inherent in there. But to me the big prize 
You get to ride one. If more elaborate rules for mounted combat. Uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> gonna gonna beat that dead horse, so to speak. <laughs> Come on. I mean, that's the be all end all, right? Yeah. The, the maiden riding the unicorn in yeah. the battle against evil. I mean, imagine a unicorn charge where you have a lance in one hand and the horn in the other. There you go. Like, like, and they're just. If you have that bearing down on you, I mean, if I was evil, I'd shit my pants. I really like the idea of there being a purity test to mm -hmm. ride the beast. And so, like, in the mythology, it's that, uh, you know, virgins and maidens and the like are able to tame the beast. Mm -hmm. It's not so much that the unicorn, like, detects their purity. It's like, ah, oh, you're worthy. It's more like they're the only ones who are able to, like, get this thing to calm down enough yeah. that you can get on it. That's been largely kind of abandoned in 5th mm -hmm. edition, and I, I kind of brought it back with a paladin order. Of a, of a goddess of love that I actually created where the idea is that the paladins of, of her order pledge themselves uh, celibacy and, and certain vows because they want to live lives worthy enough to catch their goddess's attention so that she will bring them up into her uh, heaven with them. Mm -hmm. And so they lead these very, you know, lives devoted to their goddess and the great champions are gifted something like a unicorn uh, to ride or a pegacorn or something like that. You use some of those in some campaigns that have run, uh, just so like the the idea of it. Well, I mean, yeah. in that in that one Warhammer game, was that not, didn't, didn't you give Ooh, yeah. my character, Alero? Yes, she yeah, you got the unicorn her in that. Unicorn yep. uh -huh. Because she had done a great thing and, yes. and, and stayed the course. Yeah, and oh yeah, that's right, yeah. They're using Warhammer in a similar way, sort of like, uh, you know, like the way wood elves mm -hmm. uh, would use them and, and use them in mass cavalry charges as well. Oh God, <laughs> it's just a, a cavalry charge, like a wedge of unicorns just charging down. Uh, yeah. That's just going to be nasty. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite elements from Forgotten Realms is the Knights of the Unicorn. It's yeah. sort of like a group of do-gooder knights who, have you know sort of sworn themselves to this chivalric ideal and to travel around and, and sort of represent the ideals that the unicorn stands for mm -hmm. uh, and, and take inspiration from that I thought was really interesting because you're starting to mix and make connections between the various elements of your world and, and weave it closer together and mm -hmm. I just sort of really appreciated the just that little snippet I think that's in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide yeah I think so the knight knight of the order or something like that it gives you some options and just to bounce back to uh, ingredients from them. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't have to kill them. Maybe it's a maybe a quest could be like uh, the bard needs to restring their lute or their mm. or their harp. Yeah. And so you need to go get some of the the mane of a unicorn Ooh, yeah. uh -huh. to 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 work into string yeah. or, or or for their, you know, for their their violin <laughs> like the bow of it. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, or rescue one from from capture by a wicked uh, you know, whoever, a sorceress or necromancer or something A like wicked that. bard? Yeah, wicked bard. He's <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> keeps stealing it to, make to write hit songs. Loot picks out of its, yeah. uh, out of its horn. Or like, you know, the hobgoblins are, 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 you know, cutting down every tree in the forest to make their war machines and, and, you know, spears and arrows and all that. And the unicorn is desperate for allies. Uh, you know, its its animals are not cutting it. And they're all tame now. Yeah, or the one that I was thinking of just a minute ago where it's like, there's, um, you know, a unicorn used to live in the forest, but it lived there so long that all the animals have forgotten how to behave as animals. And so now that the unicorn's gone for whatever reason, there's just kind of this bizarre forest where they're still kind of like, you know, is that a fox and a quail stay, nesting together? And, mm -hmm. Or you come across like a, a, a wolf and a rabbit arguing, I think I need to eat you. Like, I think I gotta eat. Yeah, I'm but, really hungry. Yeah, but I'm the wolf. I yeah, thought I was supposed uh, to eat you. Yeah, I think we eat you. <laughs> yeah. Which no. one? I got these big teeth. You know, it just I like because I like silly animal stuff in my DMs. Well, maybe, they, maybe they're all having a big tea party. You know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Alice it, in Wonderland could shit, easily you know? do. It'd be a great opportunity for a druid or a ranger or something to like interact with uh, the natural world in a way that's you know silly and reinforces the magical nature of that world at the same time. That mm -hmm. it's very silly. I'm glad we tackled the unicorn because it's like you really got to dig deep to sort of mm -hmm. to, to sort of figure out how to use something that's so wholesome and unqualified good <laughs> as a yeah. unicorn, right? And I also um, love the versions of unicorns that are more monstrous. Yes. Not so beautiful, but like the horn is like this like rhinoceros horn. Yeah, it's yeah. like jagged and the hooves are 
when the Greeks would write their natural histories and, and you know, it's like, oh, these are, these are clearly natural creatures, guys. Somebody saw a rhino and described <laughs> right. it to someone else who wrote the book. Who wrote the book yeah. or yeah. some kind of uh, antelope or, or something like that. You can sort of see where they're coming from. Okay, they're grasping at something. Someone heard a story mm -hmm. about something else and this is now being repeated as fact, but we're filling in the details, making it a bit more exotic yeah. at the same time. But also you get these bizarre descriptions of, of unicorns. They're like, all right, it's the body of a deer mm -hmm. and the head of a horse and the feet of an elephant. And you're like, what, what, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, Where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it's like, wait a minute, you just described a giraffe. Finding out these uh, ancient descriptions of faraway places and the uh, outlandish stories they would repeat and, and tell about them is really... Really kind of interesting, and that's where you get the weird, I'm my unicorn is black and white and red, uh, which might be like a certain type of uh, giraffe cousin, you know, or, mm -hmm. or, or kind of antelope. Narwhal are where most unicorn horns that exist in the real world come from. Yeah. All those that make up the throne of Denmark and the goblets of Austrian emperors are... They're just narwhal, narwhal tusks. And it might be that way in your world, too. Yeah. You know, who's to say the unicorn's real? This creature, this implausibly good creature that, like, its touch heals. Animals don't fight. You can't even burn anything. You're, that's too much. Yeah. Too much, even for a world of goblins and yeah. dragons. And just a, hor a horned seahorse. Just yeah. a horned seahorse. <laughs> if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Beauty. I like the. I like the. What's Wait. called the. <laughs> you fall in a maze and I'm done deep. Uh, so how do how do, do we want to do the unicorn misunderstanding, or do we want to do the pun laden intro?